Good morning, or day, whatever, hunters. Welcome back to the Gunner's Guild. As you may have guessed, I'm going to go over Nergagante and show you how he do. Hopefully this will help you out when Arc Temper Nergagante is released, and as you may have expected, this video is not going to be exclusively applied to Gunners. Trust me, I get stuff like that all the time still, so I kind of have to make a disclaimer. Anyway, let's move on. So the Nergagante fight. I'll cover the main gist of the fight and then go into a much more detail for an actual hunt. So the hunt obviously starts before it even begins, which I mean the spawn and HP rolls. Nergagante has between about 6900 and 7322 HP, or about a 400 HP variable. It doesn't seem like a lot, but that's a whole super amped elemental discharge from a charge blade that you basically just have to throw out just because of the HP roll. Now to the spawn. You also may be thinking, well, yeah, it's the same spot, it's just one area, there's no multiple spawns. Well, that's not true either. Nergagante can spawn in three different ways. The first and most optimal is Nerg being right outside the tunnel leading to his area once you go in. He'll be sitting there stationary and cleaning himself, and he'll give you quick access to his face right away. It's also great because the pillar next to him helps you break line of sight, which if you don't use it, will cause Nergagante to notice roar you, and it's going to make your fight go real bad really quick. The second position is when Nergagante is walking up the hill as you enter, and he sits down on the opposite side and starts cleaning himself over there. This one is least preferable because you have his back, so you don't really have a hit zone that you actually want. The final spawn is when Nurg is walking up the hill, but instead of cleaning himself, he turns back towards you. This one's kind of the middle ground. While walking up the hill kind of sucks in most cases, at least this way you can kind of plan and get his head as he turns around. Next is the meat and bones of the hunt. First off is the roar. Nergagante's tell for his roar, at least to me, is the position of his head. When he's going to roar, he kind of tucks in his head, kind of like a little turtle, just a little bit, and then he pushes it out forward to roar. As soon as the head moves forward, that is my cue to dodge the roar. This is the same roar as Kul Taroth and Great Jagras, which is only really relevant during the Greatest Jagras hunt. Dodging Nergagante's roar is very important because it can easily wombo combo you after a roar, and I assume AT Nerg is going to double down on this. Also, this fight is all about aggression, so the more time you waste, the harder it's going to be. A note on that is that most people don't know that when Nergagante roars, he gets slightly faster. It's a 4% stackable buff, which means every time Nerg roars, he's going to get 4% faster. So the longer you do this hunt, the harder he's going to be. You know, every single time he roars includes when he does full black spike dive bomb roars, when he does his critical state when he's at less than 30% HP roar, if he has to re-enrage, that's another one. He just gets faster and faster, so don't let the fight go on any longer than it has to. The second aspect of this fight is the most crucial, and that's the main focus of this video, and that is stagger stacking. Not to be confused with stagger locking. Let's break it down step by step. Let's start by focusing on the main parts you're going to want to damage, which is the head, the horns, and yes that's a different hit zone, and the arms. Each arm is a separate zone, so remember that. The stagger values of these are as follows. The horns are at 260 damage and break twice. The head is at 380 damage for stagger. Each arm is at 560 damage. Reaching these thresholds will cause a stagger or a flinch depending on if you break apart or just hit the arms. Horns can be broken twice, so remember that. But after that, the hit zone is basically gone and you're just going to be hitting the head. Now, after you deal about 150 damage to a part, it's going to have scars show up on it. And this is what I like to call a prime state. This means that they're going to start growing spikes a lot faster. You want to prime at least two parts at the same time. Spikes will grow here, and this is where the problems start happening. The spikes have their own hit zones. And once you hit the damage thresholds on these points, they break and cause Nergagante to topple over for about 6 seconds. This is your main pattern to the fight. Prime a spot, let the spikes grow, break the spikes, topple, rinse and repeat. Staying aggressive and keeping the soup going is how to beat Nergagante easily. Back to the staggers. As I had said, the spikes have their own hit zones. Head spikes will break at about 350 damage, and the arm spikes will break at about 280. Now, you have to keep these values in mind, because even though the spikes have their own values, the damage you deal to them lands on the zone they're attached to as well. So if you deal 300 damage to the arms and you break the spikes, well, that 300 damage is going to apply to both the arms and the spikes thresholds. Don't think this does 600 damage to Nerg, that's not the case. What I'm trying to say is that both these values go up by 300. 
Now in most cases this is fine, there's not going to be any problems. However, it is rare that you cross the stagger thresholds of both the arms and the spike break at the same time. And if that happens, then the spikes can fall off and then Nerg doesn't topple over. He just does a normal stagger. And you're probably confused as to why that happens. Well, that is stagger stacking. Different elements on the monsters have different properties and some can and cannot override others. Here's the breakdown. What I'm trying to say is that basically a stagger takes priority over over a topple and that if they both occur at the same time, a stagger is going to win and you will get that instead of a topple. This is true in other situations like with Lunastra as well, but we'll get into that on another day. So when you damage a spiky part, you can potentially go over both thresholds at the same time and kind of waste a good topple. Also if you cross that part threshold and not break the spike, you can cause a normal stagger and leave the spikes on, and you gotta be careful of that too because you can also accidentally break the spikes while he's still in a stagger animation, and that won't cause a topple because the stagger animation takes priority. So you need to pay close attention to Nergagante staggers and know when it's done so you can be sure that you can hit the spikes again and cause them to topple. It's a lot to take in, but this is the bread and butter of the fight. While the fight is going on, you're potentially going to have to manage the horns, the head, the head spikes, both the arms, and both the arm spikes. This is why I like to have at least two parts primed and spiked as much as I can. If Nergagante is down, I can hit the arms a little bit and prime them or weaken the spikes and move on to the head or vice versa. That way when he gets up, I can just touch anything and it should break and put him back down. But in case I stagger him accidentally, I have another set of spikes primed and ready to go. Also another small note is that keep in mind that when he does attacks that would cause spike explosions, even if he doesn't have spikes on the parts, they can grow at the last second and send them flying. You'll get caught by that every now and then too. Another note is when he hits about 35% of his HP, he does what I like to call a critical state roar. This is where casually the fight just gets a lot harder. So obviously he gets faster when he roars, but then he's also starting to do one two punches instead of just one. He also does jump slams more frequently, which are just awful, and now follows it up with head spikes. And he also likes to do quick slams, which are just the worst. When he does this roar, he always starts with his wing flap. Now, this causes wind pressure everywhere around him except directly in front of him, so a good way to avoid it is to just try to position it in front of his head. But dodging it's very difficult, and if you miss the dodge, you're going to get hit by the roar automatically. But if you don't get pressured and you get the roar, then you're golden. The cue for this roar is pretty similar. Nurk's going to tuck in his head a little bit and then jerk it straight up forward for a huge roar. As soon as the head goes up, that's when you gotta roll. The good thing about this roar is that when Ergogate does this, he's always gonna grow spikes on his wings and his head. If his arms are primed, those are gonna get spikes too. So you get rewarded with dodging this because you have plenty of time to break one of these spiked parts during the roar. Once Nergagante gets to 20%, he'll be scolded and try to run away, and when he gets the chance, honestly, there's not a whole lot you can do to stop the limp unless you have spikes ready to go. So I can't offer much advice here. But unless you're doing speedruns, it doesn't really matter because he only moves up right up the hill and that's like 20 seconds. However, when you wake him up in his nest, if he has black spikes, he's going to roar and then dive into the corner, which is going to make him faster. And then roar again to do the dive bomb spikes, which is going to make him even faster. So just don't let that happen. For Arc Temper Nurkigante, I assume this is going to be almost an impossible task to avoid. So we're just going to have to pray and hope he's not that bad. Anyway, that's all I have now about regarding the fight. Uh, I'll go ahead and do a run and kind of pause it and do play-by-plays. Uh, feel free to dip out here, or you can stay and watch. Up to you. Anyway, that's all for me. Good luck out there, hunters.